Okay, so we're going to talk about a number of different topics today, but uh, the first series of topics, and I'm, um, I'll probably go through all of this, and then the next topic, I'm not sure I'll go through it uh, completely. Uh, the first one is about, um, you know, basically extending uh, sort of new architectures of, of deep learning so that uh, deep learning systems can do things like, like remember things. Um, facts, learn large collections of facts, and then perhaps reason. Uh, and, and we'll talk about uh, transformer architectures because uh, you're going to have a bunch of guest lectures in the next few weeks that we'll probably talk about this a lot. And it, it's become a very important set of architectures uh, in deep learning. Um, how do we get deep learning systems to reason? and to use memory, right? When we reason, we have kind of a working memory, or when we do any kind of activity, we have sort of a temporary, uh, you know, storage of, uh, you know, the things we're working on. Uh, uh, you know, it can be linguistic based, it could be kind of remembering names of people, phone numbers, you know, things that we just wrote or whatever but it can be nonverbal, completely nonverbal. You're building a widget, for example, or you're, 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 you're driving or you're flying an airplane or sailing or something. You remember a lot of things, a lot of facts about the world, uh, and, and you sort of act on those uh, representations, if you want, of, of the world, and you update them with your new, per, your new percepts, and you reason with them to kind of plan ahead, right? So, um, you know, so far, what we've seen in deep learning systems are systems that are, you know, basically feed forward. I mean, there's recurrent nets, but um, but essentially, you 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 plug an input and you know you propagate signals to the system. Uh, you get an answer, and that's good for perception, for things like vision, audition, etc. It's good also for uh, reactive action taking. So basically, you're playing kind of a mindless video game, right? Should they not put something or one of the old uh, traditional Atari games? Uh, you don't have to do a lot of planning. You know, after after a while that you've played with it, that you've trained yourself, you you can play kind of reactively. You just you look at the screen and you know what to do. Um, you know, maybe when you learn to play that game, you need to reason, but uh, you need to kind of figure out, you know, what, what sequence of action should I take perhaps to uh, get my, you know, characters to survive or things like that. But, but after you've, you've changed yourself for a while, you can play reactively. You can see this also with uh, Grandmaster chess players where, uh, you know, you play chess against a challenging opponent and you have to think really hard. Uh, you have to like, you know, plan ahead, like a com you know, combination of, of things. Uh, and if you play a grand against a master or grandmaster, they'll play within seconds. They will just you know look at the board, and and because they know you're not a a, a very challenging opponent, um, they'll just you know reactively play. They've sort of integrated this this uh, uh, you know th this capacity of basically just directly playing from just looking at the board without having to reason very much. Um, it's only when they're, they're facing kind of a challenging opponent that they need to reason. So there's a lot of uh, tasks like this that uh, people do that are reactive. Um, and in fact, in, in psychology, uh, um, there's a, a famous psychologist, uh, also a Nobel Prize winner in economics called Daniel Kahneman, and he characterizes the two, those two types of, of, uh, of, of thinking, if you want, as system one, system two. All right, so system one is the one that you do sort of instinctively without having to reason and plan. And then system two is kind of the more deliberate uh, kind of planning of like, you know, trying to figure out what sequence of action should I take so that I optimize a particular objective, uh, things like that. And so what we've talked about so far in, in deep learning is, is very much system one. And the question is, how do we do kind of the system two type, uh, type things? And I must tell you in advance, this is not a completely solved problem. It's a very active topic of research. And it's not clear that uh, we have an answer to this. Um, it's not clear how many uh, animal species can do this. Okay, uh, probably not that many. Uh, and probably some humans can do it very well either. <laughs> but um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the L systems that we've seen so far also can learn hierarchical representations of the perceptual world, right? If you train a conventional net, on, on vision and supervised or self-supervised, it would learn sort of, you know, good hierarchical representations 
of, of preset in a way that is invariant to irrelevant um, transformations. But how do we get deep learning systems to use a working memory? So basically perform long chains of reasoning by sort of updating a, a, a list of facts maybe, or, or, or kind of simulating the world, right? So you're, you're building a widget out of your hands, you know, with wood and you're cutting wood and drilling holes and, you know, uh, you know, hammering nails and things like this. There's a lot of background knowledge that you have to use to do this, but you also have to plan, uh, plan ahead and have some idea, some physical intuition about, you know, how things, uh, how things work. You're, you're, I don't know, uh, building a building an airplane, a model airplane, right? You 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 have to know a little bit about uh, about aerodynamics, about stability, about things like this. And there's some very basic rules that are very intuitive. Nobody, you know, needs to necessarily have explained that to you. Um, you're sailing, um, so I don't know if any of you has ever uh, tried sailing. But sailing, basically, if you, if you're a really good sailor, what you have in your head is some sort of intuitive physical simulation of fluid dynamics. You kind of have an intuitive uh, sense of how the air bounces off the sail and and how the forces kind of balance between the daggerboard that's in the water or, or the keel and the sail so that the, the boat can go forward. You don't have to know all of those things, but you sail a lot better if you do. Um, same for flying. Uh, you have some physical intuition of, of how an airplane flies. You know that uh, either because you, you were told or because you have this kind of physical intuition that if the if if the if the plane slows down too much and has too much of a the, the angle of attack will have to increase if the plane needs to maintain altitude and after a point uh, the airplane will, will stall which means the air is not going to flow fast enough on the wing to kind of keep it in the air and it's just going to go into a spin or or basically fall off uh, fall off the sky and you'll have to re to recover uh, from that so. Um, you know, all of this, we, we have all of those models in our heads of, uh, of and then some of them are linguistic and some of them are non-linguistic. They are kind of physical intuition models or models of how other people behave or animals, okay, which are much much more complex models to, to some extent than, than, than physical models. Um, so how do we use a working memory? How do we perform long chains of reasoning that uh, require taking into account a lot of different facts and and, and rules, perhaps. Um, and that includes logical reasoning, but other types of reasoning as well. How do we remember massive, massive amounts of factual knowledge? Um, we know a lot of stuff that we just store in our, in our factual memory, if you want. Uh, and a lot of this is not actually stored in our cortex, it's stored in our hippocampus, which is a special piece of the brain, kind of the center of the brain that connects to every part in the cortex and that we use as a short-term memory. So. Um, you know, regardless of where you are, you probably remember what you uh, ate for breakfast, if it's past uh, breakfast for you. Uh, yeah, and, you know, you, you, know where you, you know where the door, even if you can't see it, you know where the door of the building you are in uh, is, and you know where to get there. All of this is stored in your, uh, either your short-term or long-term memory, but uh, it's probably stored in your hippocampus, not, not your cortex. Uh, so the hippocampus is capable of kind of storing facts and acquiring them very quickly. This is different from learning a skill and then compiling this into the weights of a neural net, if you want. It's more like storing a fact, like immediately, right? Uh, one shot learning, if you want. Um, how do we plan complex sequences of actions? And how do we learn hierarchical representations of action plans? So we'll talk about the first four items in this list here. Um, not, I'm not saying we have complete solutions to all those, but there is a lot of interesting work there that is uh, practical. Uh, the fifth one is really something that nobody knows how to do. Okay, so I'm not going to talk much about it, but it is a major uh, issue in sort of AI research, if you want. Okay, so what is reasoning? Um, so one way to view reasoning, this is not all types of reasoning, but one uh, possible way to that sort of encompasses a lot of different forms of reasoning is reasoning as a constraint satisfaction or energy minimization. And that's one of the reasons why we talked about energy-based models so much which is, um, you know, energy-based model allows you to kind of encompass the, the process of reasoning in, inside of a, of a learning machine, essentially. Um, so the energy function represents the constraints between observed and unobserved variable or between the unobserved variable between them. Between them. Um, so uh, is it, here's a classic example, which is used very often in uh, lectures on, on graphical models, probabilistic graphical models or factor graphs. 
And I've used that example before. Let's say we have a, f a variable, a fact, a variable, okay, which could be true or false, which is that uh, your house jolts, so your, your apartment building kind of just jolted, okay, during the night, it woke you up. Uh, and you just happen to be in California or Taiwan or Japan or Southern Italy or someplace where you have earthquakes, okay? Um, you, can, you can have two hypotheses, either a, tr uh, a truck kind of run into, into your house or your, your apartment building, uh, or there's been an explosion or an earthquake, let's say, all right? Both of those reasons to explain why the house just um, jolted are, are pretty unlikely, right? They're rare events. And so the, the, the prior probability you will give to them will be very low, which is another way of saying the energy you will give to them being true is very high, okay? So imagine that those variables are binary variables, okay? And you have an energy function that makes you pay a high price for setting that binary variable to one because you know a priori that the event is rare, okay? So that would be sort of those, those red boxes here at the bottom. Uh, the truck at your house, that's very rare. Uh, if you're in California or one of those places where you have earthquakes, uh, earthquakes are rare, but not very rare. Uh, and then you take those, those two variables, um, they're either true or false, together with the fact that you know that the house uh, uh, jolted, and you plug them into an energy function that basically computes the compatibility between, the, between those variables. So it knows that the variable house jolts is equal to one, and then it's trying to figure out what other values are the other variables that I have not observed yet. That the track, you know, I don't know if the track hit the house or there was an earthquake. Now, because the 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 prior for earthquake being true is is higher, or the energy is lower for earthquake being true than for you know track hitting the house, which is very rare, you're going to probably infer that the uh, there was an earthquake. All right. Uh, now you wake up, get out of bed, look at the window, and uh, and at the window you see that the truck actually hit your house. Immediately you infer that there was no earthquake, okay? Because now your 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 observation has been explained away by the new observation that you just made that actually a truck hit, hit the house, so you don't need the earthquake explanation anymore. That's called explaining away, okay? And then energy minimization inference will tell you this, right? So energy minimization, if you only observe the house uh, jolted, you're going to uh, conclude with some level of confidence that there is an earthquake, but with a little bit of doubt that, you know, maybe a track hit a house, there could be another set of uh, variables into this thing. Then you observe that the track actually hit the house, so now this becomes a gray variable that is observed, uh, and all of a sudden, the earthquake becomes unlikely because you explained away the observed uh, variables. Okay, so that's a form of inference or reasoning through uh, energy minimization, where the rules that apply to the world basically are seen as energy terms, okay? So there's a long tradition actually in traditional AI in, in doing this kind, of, uh, this kind of reasoning in, uh, in terms of constraint satisfaction. There's even actually programming languages that have been invented to kind of specify things like this. Um, and there's been uh, the, the whole uh, uh, subfield of uh, graphical models, probabilistic uh, Bayesian networks, graphical models, or factor graphs, uh, actually resulted from attempts to kind of model reasoning as some sort of likelihood maximization or energy minimization. Uh, and because you have energies that you can turn into probabilities, you can compute marginal probabilities of all those variables, right? Um, if you have a an energy for a particular configuration of variables, you do e to the minus uh, this energy divided by the sum over all the configurations of the variables uh, that are possible, and, and you get a, a probability for that particular configuration. And you can marginalize over variables you don't know. Um, okay, so uh, inference reasoning, particularly probabilistic reasoning, but also logic reasoning, can be seen as a form of energy minimization. Um, so, so essentially what you will have is a list of, if you have, you know, a, a large uh, set of problems that you want your machine to be able to, to solve, what you would have, and this is, this is kind of, you know, turning kind of deep learning into something that's very classical in, in sort of traditional AI, good old fashioned AI, um, is that you have a list of, of variables, um, it's called a knowledge base, 
And those list of uh, predicates, okay? Those predicates can be true or false. They can have a value attached to them, which is basically an energy. You can think of it this way, right? Um, and some of those uh, are known. The value of some of those are known. Those are the ones that are observed. And some of those are unknown. And then separately, you have a, uh, a, 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 base, uh, a database of rules. And rules are just energy terms. Each of those energy terms will take a subset of the variables in the long list of variable and, and kind of compute uh, uh, incompatibility value for whether those, those variables are compatible or not. So for example, the serial example of, uh, of the earthquake or the track, um, uh, you could take those three binary variable, the house jolts, the, the, there, is an, there was an earthquake or a track hit the house, and you can plug them into a rule, which is just an energy term that says, uh, I want to compute the, the logical OR of, in, of the first input and the second input. So the track in the house OR, there is an earthquake, okay? And if that logical OR of those two variables is true, uh, then the house jolt is also true and vice versa, okay? So it's a constraint between uh, the house jolts and either the track in the house OR, there was an earthquake, right? or both, okay, the OR actually includes, uh, it's an inclusive OR, right? So you can think of this as, as, a, as a constraint. If those variables were continuous or distributions or things like this, uh, then, you know, you could have an energy function. If they are binary, uh, those, you know, you can think of this as a rule, essentially, that says, you know, uh, that implements a constraint uh, between, between those variables. Um, and you can do, you can perform the inference in any direction, right? You, if you know that there was an earthquake, you can deduce, deduce that the, the house uh, 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 jolts if the earthquake kind of was local, you know, things like that. So, so you could view uh, this sort of form of inference by energy minimization as uh, if a, a kind of weird sort of continuous smooth form of traditional logic-based uh, reasoning where you have uh, a list of uh, uh, variable values, okay, some of which are known, some of which are unknown, uh, are unspecified. A list of rules, which basically are energy terms that take subsets of those variables, uh, each, of, each of which takes subset of those variables into account. And what you do is that you, you, you look through, uh, you look for rules for which a subset of the variables are known, and you apply the rule, which means you infer uh, a value or a list of energies for each of the possible values for the, for the variables that are unknown. Okay, if they're binary, it's easy. You just have to remember two, two energies for those variables. And you keep doing this with all the rules until the, the content of the, the variable values can stabilize. Okay, and this is, you can think of this as sort of, you know, probabilistic logical inference, if you want. Okay, I can't say that there are a lot of practical implementations of this where deep learning is used to learn the, the rules. This is a thing that people are working on. It's very much at the, at the research uh, uh, level. There's, there's a lot of interesting work in, those, in this area, but I can't say that it's sort of very practical. Those kinds of things have been practical in the past in the context of uh, uh, graphical models, uh, probability graphical models, factor graphs, and things like this. But um, uh, um, but but the rules and the and the facts are basically kind of written by hand, if you want. Um, you know, including things that use energies or log, or log, log probabilities or things like that, right? Uh, but they're all pretty much written by hand. So you know, learning things like this is, uh, although in principle it's possible, might be difficult. Okay, here is another form of, of reasoning through energy minimization, and that would be for planning. Okay, so you, um, uh, you're you facing a situation where you want uh, a piece of the world in front of you to result in a particular state. Okay, you're building a widget, for example, you have, you have to figure out what sequence of action should I, uh, should I uh, take to arrive at a result, or, um, or you're planning to... Uh, uh, you know, go to go to class at NYU. Perhaps in the future, you'll, that will actually be something you need to do. And you have to figure out, like, you know, how do I plan this? To, I have to get out of my building, so I gotta, you know, walk towards the door. Uh, where is the door? I have to remember where the door is. I, I need to uh, stand up and walk towards the door. 
open the door, etc. And then you know, I have to decompose all of those acts into kind of millisecond by millisecond control of my muscles. Okay. Uh, so this is a uh, a kind of, of reasoning uh, planning that is a, a classical one in, in AI as well. Also a classical one in, in a, a field of engineering called optimal control or control theory. Uh, and the way uh, this is done in robotics, for example, or, or other types of, uh, of control situations is that um, you observe the world. So the world is, is X, okay? That's your observation of the world. You run through a perception module and that perception module, let's say a complement, extracts some idea of the state of the world and you call that S. All right, so it's going to be incomplete because you don't have a perfect observation of the entire world. You just have a approximate observation of just the world around you that you know goes into your your sensors. So you have some estimate of the world uh, S. Uh, let's let's say S of t at time t. Okay, because we're going to run this over several time steps. Um, so S of t is your estimate of the world as time uh, state of the world at time t, or at least the relevant part of the state of the world at time t, and you have an internal model of the world, a predictive model of the world, um, which is your ability to predict what the, consequence, what the consequences of your actions are going to be on the world if you take a particular action. If you take a step forward, you know that you're gonna move forward. You're, gonna, you're not gonna immediately, uh, uh, you know, being transported to the other side of the world, right? You know that your trajectory as a physical object is somewhat continuous, right? You can't, you can't just like snap your fingers and jump to another place, right? So, you know, if you step, take a step in, in a direction, particular direction, you're gonna go in that direction by the length of a step, right? So that is included in your model of the world and your model of your own dynamics, right? Um, so given an action you're taking, A of T, you feed this into the model of the world together with the previous state of the world and you get the next state of the world. Okay, but there is an issue here, which is that the world is not entirely predictable. It's a lot about the world that you're not observing. Okay, we're going to represent this by a latent variable, z of t. Uh, and you may have some idea of, you know, the, the, the prior of that latent variable. So, for example, um, I'm in a room right now, with, you know, um, has a door. I actually don't know if the door is closed or open. I think I remember that I closed it. So, my prior is going to be that the door is closed, but maybe it's not. Okay, so depending on whether it's closed or not, I'm going to have to decide whether to open it or not once I, once I see it. But if I'm... Uh, but you know that that will change my uh, my plan if you want. So uh, there may be a lot of things that happen in the world that you just cannot possibly predict um, because you don't have either because you don't have complete observation. So this is called uh, epistemic uh, uncertainty, which means uh, you know your uncertainty about the world is due to the fact that you don't have a complete knowledge of the world. Um, there's another type of uncertainty about the world called aleatoric uncertainty, which is due to the fact that the world maybe is intrinsically unpredictable or stochastic, okay? So, um, you know, this, is, this may take us to a kind of philosophical question here, but uh, even if you assume that the world is uh, completely deterministic, which actually physicists tell us it is, okay, in, in, in some interpretation of physics at least, um, we still may not be able to predict uh, what the future is going to be. So let me take an example. Okay, you can play uh, head or tail with uh, with a coin, uh, and you know, I if I, uh, I throw a coin in the air and I put it in my hand and I ask you is this head or tail, you know, you basically don't have much information to to decide whether it's head or tail. You're going to assume the coin is fair, and so you have you know probability one half for for each of the two outcomes. Now, imagine you have access to you know, a ridiculously powerful supercomputer, as well as a ridic ridiculously powerful uh, uh, perception system or sensors that basically give you the state of the entire chunk of the universe within uh, you know, a cubic kilometer around me. Okay, so that includes the entire state of my brain, right? Uh, now that would be an, an enormous amount of information because you have to know the position of every atom and molecule and and entanglements between particles. I mean, it would be just insane, but um, let's imagine this is possible and you have you know, a supercomputer the size of your entire universe that's capable of simulating this. Then there is no uncertainty as to whether the 
a very little uncertainty about whether the uh, the coin is going to end up head or tail because you can pro probably just simulate the entire thing and predict whether it's going to be head or tail. So uh, why am I telling you this? Because it's not entirely clear what is uh, aleatoric or uh, 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 epistemic uh, uncertainty. It depends on, on your knowledge and depends on your computing power, if you want, computing ability. So for two different people, you know, for one person, a phenomenon might look completely random. For another person, that same phenomenon might look organized. Uh, let me take an example. Uh, if you're trained, you know, if you're kind of used to listening to Western music and, and all of a sudden you listen to, I don't know, Indian classical music, it looks very strange, right? And there's a lot of things that you just can't, you know, you can't fathom, basically. You can't predict what's, you know, when the music is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to go. Uh, or, you know, you're trained uh, to listen to a particular type of, uh, of folk music and you're exposed to, uh, you know, 1960 jazz improvisation. To, to you, it looks random. It may look completely random, but in fact, it's not. It's actually very organized. It's just that there is structure that you don't perceive, right? Uh, so a lot of things like this are, you know, depend on, depend on your training. But so much for the little bit of philosophy here and epistemology. Um, so we have a model of the world that uh, takes three inputs, the current estimate of the state of the world, a latent variable that maybe represents what we don't know about the world that we may draw randomly, um, and then an action we're taking, and our model of the world predicts the next state. Um, we can use this for planning. So let's imagine that the world is essentially deterministic, so we don't have much of a latent variable. Um, let's say we are kind of shooting a rocket, uh, and we want the rocket to rendezvous with the International Space Station or land on the moon. We can completely plan the trajectory. We have a complete dynamical model of the rocket. We know exactly how much it weighs. We know how much it, uh, you know, uh, spends fuel per per second uh, for a particular throttle. Uh, we can control the nozzle orientations and the thrust. Uh, we know the density of the of the atmosphere wherever the the rocket is. We know the we know the force of gravity. We know you know. A lot of that stuff, right? So we can we can write down a physical model of what is the state, what is going to be the state of the of the rocket uh, in one millisecond, knowing the state of the rocket right now and the action I'm taking, which is the thrust of the engines and the direction uh, of the controls. Um, and the other variables that come in are the environment variables, the how high I am, what the you know density of the atmosphere is, um, um, the temperature, and whatever, right? So I can completely what I can do is uh, Imagine a sequence of actions and then run this model forward, okay? And then compute the trajectory of the rocket. Okay, so after a while, the rocket is gonna be at some location, you know, in orbit or someplace, and it can compute the squared error, let's say, between the distance, between, which would be the distance between the, or the square distance between the rocket and the space station, uh, both in terms of position and velocity, okay? Uh, and I'm gonna put this into this, C function. So the C function takes the state as, as an input variable and computes a cost of, you know, how satisfying is my state, right? I can compute the sum of those cost functions over a trajectory, uh, which would be, for example, the sum of the square distance of the rocket to the space station over the trajectory. And then what I can do is through energy minimization, by minimizing the sum of those costs over the trajectory, I can find a sequence of actions that will minimize that sum of the costs, okay? And what that minimization, I can do this by backprop, right? I can just backpropagate gradient through this entire system and figure out the sequence of action that will minimize that cost. If the cost is the square of the distance of the rocket to the space station in terms of position and velocity, uh, the effect of this planning is going to be to basically get the rocket as close as possible to the position and velocity of the International Space Station as fast as possible because it minimizes the integral over the over the trajectory. So it's going to try to get it's going to try to get there as fast as possible. You can put other costs in there. There are things like how much fuel I consume, you know, things like that. Constraints on like how much fuel I can use. Constraints on like how much I want the throttle to be high. You know, all kinds of things you can wrap into this uh, this cost function CLS. But the point is. I can do uh, 
planning this way by basically minimizing an energy. And that's pr pretty complex planning. In fact, this is the kind of planning that people can do with by hand to plan the trajectory of a rocket. You have to use computers to do it for that reason. Um, and that's why people at, you know, uh, in you know, various space agencies around, around the world, uh, but in the 60s, it was, you know, mostly the, the US and, and Russia uh, were, were doing initially by hand and then eventually using what is now called model predictive control, where, which is this process of basically unrolling a dynamical model, mathematical model of the dynamics of the rocket. And then by gradient descent or some minimization method, figure out the sequence of actions that will minimize a particular cost function uh, that is you know, characterized kind of good trajectories versus bad ones. Um, a lot of this was developed in the 1950s and 60s in Russia and the US. Uh, and, and other places, but they, they were really active on it because it, it was a space race, right? Um, and in fact, uh, the idea of backpropagating back propagating gradient through a structure like this, which you can think of as basically a recurrent neural net, uh, to find a sequence of action, uh, goes back to the, uh, in the US, it's, it's, it's known as the Kelly Bryson algorithm, uh, and it goes back to the early 1960s. And uh, in Russia, there were kind of theoretical work around those lines. Um, uh, by a guy called Pontryagin. So there's something like the Pontryagin optimality principle. So, you know, things like this were developed. So in a sense, backprop was invented by, by these guys. Okay, they didn't use it for running. They used it for model predictive control, optimal control. Okay, so uh, there's, a, there's a movie, a very nice movie called Hidden Figures, uh, which some of you may have seen. It's a story of... Uh, uh, mathematicians that worked at NASA in the 1950s, the late 50s, early 60s. And those were, those were mostly black women who were trained in mathematics. And they were uh, employed basically by NASA to compute trajectories for rockets before there were computers, okay? In fact, the, the title was calculators, okay? They were mathematicians, um, uh, but NASA called them calculators. and uh, and they were, you know, using the, the math, essentially, uh, numer you know, so before computers, they had like, you know, calculating machines and things like this. They were like running equations and solving differential equations, basically, and, uh, and sort of, you know, solving them numerically when they couldn't do them, uh, solve them analytically, and, and basically computing uh, trajectories for, for uh, all the rockets. And then in the 60s, they basically trained themselves to program in Fortran because computers were became available at NASA and they kind of became, you know, the first ones probably to implement those kinds of algorithms that I just talked about. You should watch that movie, it's a, it's a wonderful movie. Um, it's really very interesting. Um, it tells a lot about the, you know, social history of, uh, uh, you know, in the US, uh, which is complicated. There is a question about this diagram. Okay. Do I understand it correctly? So A is the control and Z is like noise uncertainty in the system? Right, so A is is the uh, the control, the command, if you want that you know. So for a rocket, it would be the thrust of the engines, the control of the of the nozzles, the direction of the nozzles, uh, maybe the other jets, you know, that control the. In the case of the you know Elon Musk uh, spaceship, it would be also the the fins. It has fins. So anything that you can use to uh, you know affect the state of the system, essentially, uh, in a car. You essentially have two things. You have the angle of the wheel and you have the position of the pedals, right? Accelerator and brake. Uh, those are the two controls in an automatic car. Um, you know, anything that you can use to kind of uh, change the, the state of the system under, uh, under consideration. In a video game, it's the, you know, the, the joystick position and the button actions or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> right, and Z is the part of the state of the world that you think is relevant for the problem, but that you do not directly observe. And you may have to infer either from observation or just draw randomly. And if you have to draw it, draw it randomly, then you may have to run this multiple times for multiple drawings of the Z variable, which may result in different outcomes, okay? So for example, if you use this uh, for, I don't know, financial investment, right? So your gene that model now. So A is, you know, whether you buy or sell a particular financial instrument. Uh, G would be the, the next state of the stock market, right? Uh, given the action you took. 
and Z would represent the action that everybody else are taking, right? It's a huge vector that, um, and, and you assume that those people are rational, so they optimize their own objective. Uh, so there would be kind of a, what's called a multi-agent system where you don't have one copy of this, but you have as many copies of this as there are sort of, you know, important players on the stock market, if you want. Um, and uh, and then you, you know, you can, you can run this forward, but then what's important there is that you don't know what the other guys are doing. Uh, so you have to infer this from the observations that you're, you're making at, the, at every time step. Uh, and, uh, and you have to hedge your bets. So if your prediction is very uncertain, if there's a huge amount of uncertainty about the prediction of where, where the world is going, where the stock market is going, uh, then there may not be a, a definite optimal action, uh, action sequence that you can take. Okay? There's going to be a risk attached to it that you may need to uh, estimate as well. Um, so, you know, for multiple drawings of the Z variables, you're going to have multiple outcomes, right? So, I mean, it's very similar than, you know, when you play, uh, you play chess, uh, there is a Z variable, which is what the other player is going to play in response to your, um, to, to your play, right? So you're going to play, your opponent is going to play, you don't know what the opponent is going to play. So there's multiple options. Okay. Then for each of those options, you're going to play something. And then your opponent is going to play, you know, something else, but you don't know what. So you need to kind of explore that, that tree of possibilities. Um, so in this case, the Z variable is discrete. It's what, you know, the other, the other uh, what your opponent is playing. And every time you take a step, the opponent can take, you know, something like 36 different uh, uh, steps, actions. And so you're going to have 36 different values for possible values for ST plus one, right? And it grows exponentially as you go down. So, okay. So that's a kind of a discrete situation. We have to do, you know, tree exploration, essentially. Uh, you can imagine sort of discrete situations. Like, for example, you're, you're driving on the highway and there's a car right next to you. Uh, and you observe the car was swerving a little bit. Probably the, the driver was kind of looking at a smartphone or something uh, or not paying attention or fiddling with the, the radio. So you, you have a lot of uncertainty about the position, the future position of that car. And as a consequence, to hedge your bets, you're going to probably change lanes so that you stay away from this car and you're going to pass that car pretty quickly so that if by any chance the car swerves uh, again, uh, you're not going to be hit by it, okay? If on the other hand, the car is driving really straight, your uncertainty about where, where this car is going to be next is relatively small. Your, you know, the latent variable of what the driver is doing, if you want, is, is as a fairly small variance. You pretty much know the car is going to stay in its lane and not swerve too much. And so it's pretty safe to just drive uh, past it um, on, on, the, on, the next, on the next lane, right? Uh, but if the car is acting weird, you can stay away from it. So that's an example of you know, planning ahead by having a model of the world, but you take into account the uncertainty about your prediction to basically take a course of action that will minimize your cost, your cost being high if you hit another car. Okay, uh, and and taking into account the uncertainty so that um, uh, you know the likelihood of you hitting another car is, is small. And, and we'll see a more concrete example of this. Then Alfred will come back to this also in a in a practicum. Okay, so in a, it, but what I'm saying here is that you know the, this process of of inference by energy minimization can be used for all kinds of different things, right? For planning, for logical reasoning for uh, or, you know, probabilistic logical reasoning, you know, all, all kinds of different things concerning uh, satisfaction of various kinds, problem solving of various kinds. Um, so it's a pretty general thing. Uh, in practice, it comes down to like, do I have a good model of the world, first of all? What is the uncertainty? And how do I make predictions that allow multiple predictions, okay? which is why we've talked about latent variable energy-based models, essentially. And then can I, by gradient descent to some other process, can I find a sequence of actions that will um, minimize the cost? So we've talked about um, uh, inference by energy minimization, but there are other types of, of inference, which to some extent can be reduced to that, but people tend to think of them in, in, in another way. And, and this is the idea of you know, basically having a working memory. So it's, you know, it's similar to the, the situation I was describing here. We have kind of a working memory that contains, 
you know, variables and values, and you have rules and, and you apply the rules recursively. And every time you apply the rules, you take facts from the memory, uh, compute new facts that may be true or false, and then write those values back into the variable uh, uh, database, knowledge base. Um, so you could think of an architecture to do this that would be what's called a memory augmented network. So it's essentially a, a recurrent neural net. You can think of it this way, right? So this could be a few layers of a neural net or a very complex one. And then you take the output of this neural net, feedback, feedback to the input. But then what this neural net is doing is that at every time step, it, it reads from a memory, okay? Perhaps fa existing facts, right? A working memory. Uh, and, uh, or, or statements or words, whatever. So it reads from this memory and then it crunches on it in one cycle and then it writes back uh, stuff to that memory. So essentially you'll have one step of a recurrent net and that recurrent net will produce an address to a memory and a memory is just another module, okay? So this is a memory. And this is sort of the, the address of the memory, right? So you, you feed a vector to this memory and the memory kind of use that vector as kind of an address and then returns another vector. And that goes into your recurrent net again, okay? So there is kind of a similar input uh, here and the recurrent net also has an internal state that it feeds to that next step. Okay, so we can call this S of T uh, we can call this uh, Q of T for query, okay? We can, just, we can call this V of T for value, okay? Coming out of the memory. Uh, and if we have a memory that we, we don't write into, um, we can sort of repeat the process at the next time step. Etc. So an example could be, so here's an example of how this has been used and this is relatively old work from uh, some of my colleagues at Facebook, uh, uh, called a memory network. And what they, what they did was uh, write into the memory, uh, basically a, a number of statements that correspond to a story, okay? So for example, uh, John goes to the kitchen, uh, uh, John picks up the milk, uh, John moves to the backyard, he drops the milk there. Um, then, you know, Jane goes to the bedroom, blah, blah, blah. So you can have kind of a sequence of statements like this. Uh, each are encoded into a vector that is stored into, uh, into the memory, essentially. Okay, so every statement in the story is basically a vector in the memory. Um, and the way you train the system, so you unroll it in time three or four times. Uh, and you give it a question here. So there would be sort of a, a network here that encodes a question uh, into the state. And then you have another network here that produces an answer, a text, which would be yes or no. Or it could be, you know, the question could be like, how many people are in the kitchen right now? Uh, and the answer could be three, or it could be, where is the milk? And the answer would be in the backyard. Uh, or, or the question, you know, would be, uh, you know, did John and Jane ever were, uh, were, were John and Jane uh, ever in the same room at the same time? Something like this, right? Um, so you put a question here, run this through the system, and the, the system has access to this, uh, the whole list of uh, events in the story, in this memory. And then in the end, you, you train the system supervised by telling it the answer to that question. And you backpropagate gradient through all this, and the system learns to kind of change the parameters of the memory. I'll tell you in a minute how it's implemented, as well as the parameters of the recurrent net in such a way that for any question, you get the correct answer. And you have to train this on a lot of data, so it only works with sort of relatively, with sort of artificial toy problems where you can generate as much data as you want. Okay, this is called a memory network. And so this is a paper by uh, uh, Chisholm Weston and his colleagues at uh, Facebook. This is one of the early papers coming out of Facebook AI research. 
Uh, a paper that appeared just uh, very shortly thereafter by also people from Facebook Air Research, Armand Joulin and Tomasz Mikolov, uh, stack augmented recurrent neural nets, where the memory is kind of a, a stack kind of memory. We push uh, uh, facts into it and you can pop, pop them. This is good for parsing, for example. Uh, almost simultaneously, but uh, a little after, uh, a couple of papers from, from DeepMind came out, the neural training machine and differentiable neural computers, which were also had this idea of a recurrent net that talks to some sort of differentiable memory. Okay, so now how do you implement a differentiable memory? Uh, and this is an idea that at the time uh, was not very, uh, was, was very new and not very popular, but then completely took over essentially uh, the, the, the space of uh, things like NLP and now even computer vision and things like this. Uh, so this idea of having an associative uh, soft differentiable memory inside of a neural net. Um, so how do you do this? You, um, you build the memory this way. You, you have an input vector, okay? Which you can view as an address, right? If you know how like a computer memory works, right? You give an address, which is a, a, a string of bits. Um, that address is compared with a bunch of uh, binary templates, which basically represent all two to the n binary combinations, right? So if your memory has uh, 64 kilobytes, for example, right? Uh, the address is 16 bits. And you have a thing that will compare the 16 bit of the address to every possible combination of 16 bits, of which there are 65,000. Uh, you know, a little more than 65,000, right? Um, and then there's, a, there's one that's going to match and your memory chip is going to output the eight bits that are at that location, okay? That's how a RAM chip works, basically. Uh, of course, RAM chips are big, much bigger than 64 kilobytes nowadays. Um, so, here we're going to do the same thing, but it's going to be sort of a soft continuous version. Okay, so we take a vector, a continuous vector, some dimension. We compare that vector with a bunch of so-called key vectors by just computing the dot product. Okay, so the dot product is going to be uh, large if the two vectors are aligned, and essentially going to be zero if the two vectors are orthogonal, and going to be minus one if the two vectors are opposite. Okay, no minus one because they're not necessarily normalized, but negative. Okay, now you take all of those dot products, you plug them into a softmax. So no, now what you get is a bunch of numbers that are between zero and one, and they sum to one. Okay, and what you do next is that you have a bunch of so-called value vectors, uh, which are basically the represent the content of the memory. And what you're computing now is the weighted sum of those values by those coefficients. Okay, so imagine that one of those vectors is exactly identical to one vector, like let's say this guy, and orthogonal, let's say, to all the other ones. Okay, so you're going to get, here you're going to get a positive dot product, and for all the other guys, you're going to get zero. You plug this into a softmax, you get a high coefficient for this guy, and smaller coefficients for all uh, all the other guys, right? Possibly much smaller coefficients, depending on the beta and your softmax, and depending on the length of the vectors as well. Um, so now what you're going to get on the output, because you know all those guys basically don't count because their coefficients are going to be small, so you're only going to recover that corresponding vi, okay? And that's basically a RAM chip, okay? That's how a RAM actually works. Uh, it does compute the sum, actually, but because only one of the values uh, has a, a coefficient of one, uh, you only see that one, you don't see the other ones. But here, because those coefficients are continuous, uh, we're going to see some linear combination of all those vectors at the output of our, of our memory. Now, the cool thing about this is that this is all completely differentiable. You can backpropagate gradient from the output all the way down to the query, to the input, to the address. You can compute the gradient of the output with respect to the value vectors. You're going to get a large gradient for the, the value that was had a high coefficient and smaller gradients for the ones that have small coefficients. You can even backpropagate all the way to the keys. 
So you can learn the keys, actually, that will produce an output that presumably would be useful um, subsequently. OK? So that's the formula here. Uh, compute the y values that are the, uh, uh, sorry, you compute the CIs, which is a softmax applied to the dot product of the input address uh, called the query and the, and the key vectors. Plug this to a softmax, you get a bunch of coefficients between 0 and 1 that sum to 1. Compute the linear combination of those, uh, of, of the, the value vectors, where the coefficients are those, uh, those CIs, and that's the output. Okay? So that was the idea in this memory network. Um, and since this has been reused a lot for all kinds of situations. Now, this mechanism of uh, you know, basically deciding what input or what vector to pay attention to based on uh, the dot product of a query and a bunch of keys, that's called the attention mechanism. Okay? People now call this attention um, or soft attention. I, I don't know if it's an appropriate term, but that's that's the term that uh, is, is now accepted for this. Uh, because what it does is that it basically causes this uh, this network to to pay attention to essentially one or a subset of uh, of those Vs. Now imagine that those Vs are not vectors, but are themselves outputs of another neural net, you know, the lower layers of a neural net then what the system will do, or maybe the input sentences of a story, or the words of a, of a sentence, then what a system like this can do is essentially dynamically choose to pay attention to a particular uh, output of the previous layer or a particular word of the input sentence. Uh, and that proved to be revolutionary in the context of things like NLP and particularly translation. Uh, so you probably heard of uh, Professor Kim Yong-cho, who is at NYU. Um, when he was a postdoc at University of Montreal, uh, together with uh, Yosha Benjo and, and, and uh, uh, Dimitri Badanao, he published a paper on this idea of using attention for translation. And it basically revolutionized the field. That's basically what he is most famous for, OK? The, the idea that, um, that he proposed was uh, let's say you have an input sentence. So an input sentence, you know, you have a, a, a particular word and you represent this word by a very large vector, which is basically a one hot vector that represent that has a one. So this vector has the size of the vocabulary. Um, in English, could be 100 or 200,000 or something. Uh, and this vector has one one at one location that represents which word, let's say it's the word cat. Um, so in the lexicon, in the vocabulary, the word cat appears here. You set that component to one and all the other ones to zero. And then you multiply this by some matrix. And with this, you produce uh, a vector of dimension, let's say 500 or something. Uh, and you're gonna learn this uh, matrix, of course, it's part of the network, but you do this for every word in your sentence. So a sentence is basically a sequence of those things. You run each of them to the same so-called embedding matrix, okay? And multiplying a one hot vector by a matrix is very simple because it consists in just selecting the, the column in that matrix that for which the, the component is one, right? You don't need to actually do the product. Uh, and there are special functions in PyTorch to do this, right? Um, so what you get now is a sequence of vectors that represent the input sentence. And let's say you want to do translation. So this is a sentence in, uh, in uh, Mandarin, and you want to translate it in English, into English, so you have to produce a uh, word. Now, or, or let's, say it's, it, let's say it's English to German, okay? So this is an English sentence, and you want to translate it into German. Now, there's an issue with German, which is that the word order in German is very different from the word order in, uh, in English. What's more, in German, there's a lot of words that are actually composed words, so there are they look like a single word, but they're actually kind of multiple words that are stuck with each other. And so to find an appropriate translation for an English sentence, you have to, when you, know, when you are about to produce the first word, you have to figure out which, what is the corresponding word or, or, or expression or combination of words in the input sentence uh, that I need to, to pay attention to, basically, to translate. Uh, and that's where attention uh, can play a role. So basically, 
uh, there's going to be some big neural net here, but there's going to be another neural net, and this neural net uh, is going to take into account all of those vectors or, or a big subset of them, compute the dot product of those vectors with some, some vector, uh, okay, and then produce coefficients, and those coefficients are attention coefficients. So there, there are numbers between zero and one, and you're going to multiply those vectors by those things, feed them through, uh, compute their sum, and then feed that to a few layers of a neural net that is going to predict what the first word is, okay? And what this guy, uh, what this red guy can do is essentially choose at any particular point which of the input word is relevant to produce the uh, corresponding output word. All right. Now, this word is produced. And so what you do now is that you take this word and feed it basically to the, the next uh, version of this, right? So you replicate that network if you want. The weights can be shared. I mean, there, there are various architectures to do this, but you can imagine doing this. This is going to you know, take the previous word into, into account and then produce the second word. And you sort of keep doing this. Um, so this was not the first, but the second successful attempt at trying to do uh, language translation with neural net. The first attempt was some gigantic multilayer LSTM by Ilya Suskever at Google at the time. Um, but then the, the Montreal group and uh, with, with Kim Young uh, was able to basically get really good results with a much more compact uh, network that used this notion of, uh, of attention. Uh, that completely revolutionized the field in just a few months, a, a team from Stanford uh, implemented this idea and won uh, a big language translation competition with it. And all of a sudden, the entire industry jumped over this idea and started implementing transition system based on attention. And a lot of people in natural language processing said, like, you know, this works for translation. It might work also for other things uh, in, in sort of language interpretation. And then there was a paper uh, from a team at Google uh, whose title was Attention is All You Need. Uh, this was a few years ago. Um, and basically what they said is you can build a neural net entirely built out of modules that are essentially associative memories, very simple, similar to the ones that we, we talked about uh, that the, to these, these objects, okay? Uh, and their entire network was built out of modules of this type. And they called it a transformer. Uh, before I go there, um, I want to talk about uh, something called, um, so this is a less than two years old. Uh, this is uh, Sana Sup, uh, Supatar. He, he, he was a PhD student here at, at NYU with uh, Rob Fergus and me. And uh, he's now a research scientist at Facebook in Paris. And, uh, and he did this uh, at Facebook, uh, where basically it's one of those uh, associative memory network where you have a feedforward network that produces uh, uh, you know, inputs to itself, essentially. Think of this as recurrent net, uh, as well as an associative memory here, which you know, has this sort of attention mechanism. Um, and you know, he came up with several architectures to, uh, to use this, where basically the entire network is based on, on this uh, kind of Kind of attention. Uh, and this is, you can think of this as sort of a, a neural net that has memory because every time you, you back propagate gradient through this, uh, with respect to the values that are in the memory, those values basically change, they can change a lot. And so the, the system can just remember things, okay? You can just store things in memory. So this seems to be perhaps, it could be a model for how the hippocampus in the brain kind of stores Memory. Uh, memories in the hippocampus are stored in uh, fast changing weights of, of neurons in the hippocampus. It can change much faster than the, the synaptic weights in the cortex. 
and they're used for essentially short-term memory. So um, there are people, older people, for example, who basically lose short-term memory completely. And it's basically because their hippocampus uh, shrinks. So, you know, they'll tell you a story and then you see them the next day and then they may not remember that they saw you uh, the day before. They'll tell you the same story again, okay? Um, and that's probably a story that's old because if it's something that was, you know, happened last week, they probably don't remember it. So if you don't have a specific module to store uh, facts, you know, short-term memory in your brain, you cannot remember things for more than about 20 seconds. The, there is some, some memory in your cortex because your cortex, you know, the activity of the neurons in your cortex has a state. Uh, and if your cortex was some sort of recurrent net, then you could think that that state is a kind of memory, right? But the thing is, it's been shown that the, the state of the cortex basically becomes independent of this initial state within 20 seconds. So you cannot remember things with the state of the neurons in your cortex for more than about 20 seconds. If you want to remember things for more than this, you need your hippocampus. That's your RAM, if you want, okay? Now we're gonna talk about uh, transformers, particularly transformers that are pre-trained in a self-supervised manner. And we talked already, already about denoising autoencoders. So this is going to use the technique of denoising autoencoders, except it's called masked autoencoder, but it's really the same thing. Uh, and that led to another paper by, uh, by Google called, uh, with a model called BERT, um, which means bi-directional something. <laughs> I can't remember actually. Um, the name really doesn't matter because there was sort of a tradition in the field of uh, finding acronyms that corresponded to uh, Sesame Street characters. Uh, if you are from outside the US and you don't know what Sesame Street is, it's a, it's a TV show for, for kids and they have various characters called Bert and Ernie and things like this. And so there's a sequence of a whole series of uh, uh, models in natural language processing, uh, deep learning models that basically are named after Sesame Street characters. And Bert is probably the most famous one. Um, okay. Right, so uh, you've, you've, you've heard about denoising autoencoders. I believe you heard about this even uh, yesterday. Yeah, last week. Uh, that was last week, I'm sorry, Thursday, from uh, Alfredo. Uh, I mean, I talked about it, but Alfredo uh, talked a bit more about it, right? So you start from a, a Y, uh, which comes from your data. You corrupt it, which means you're blocking certain pieces of it, or you're adding noise to it, or something like that. You corrupt it in some way. And then you run through a neural net and you measure the reconstruction error. So you, you're, you're training the system to basically reconstruct the uncorrupted Y from a corrupted version. And uh, to be completely consistent, this X here should not be X, it should be Y hat, if I want to be consistent uh, in notations. Yeah, that's what that's what's on, on my slides. So that's the, right. the Y, Y hat, and then the Y tilde on top. Yeah. Uh, so this is, just pretend this is Y hat. Uh, and and the idea of training, uh, so the transformer with this uh, paper, Attention is All You Need, uh, by was Wani et al. from Google. And then there was a, this follow up paper by Devlin, which was the idea of training a transformer using uh, the denoising autoencoder idea or using kind of contrastive energy based training, if you can, you can think of it this way, you can interpret it this way. The idea goes, goes back a long time, denoising autoencoders go back to Pascal Vincent. In fact, I had some stuff on this in my PhD thesis in 1987, but um, in a different context. Uh, Colbert and Weston, in the context of NLP, actually used uh, a contrastive training idea to pre-train their system to represent text as well. Uh, so there were really pioneers there. But uh, really, that became popular with uh, this, this paper on the BERT model. Um, so take a piece of text, remove some of the words from that text, typically 10 to 15% of the words, you replace them by a blank marker, in some cases, you can actually replace them by another word, another just a random, randomly picked word of some kind. You run through the, the system and you train the system to predict the words that are missing. So you tell the system which words are missing uh, and you train it to predict the words that are missing. Now, obviously the system can do a perfect job at this because, uh, so if I say, uh, you know, the cat chases the blank in the kitchen, you can probably guess that blank is mouse. Uh, 
or if I say the, the blank chases the mouse in the kitchen, you can probably say that blank is cat, okay? But if I say the blank chases the blank uh, in the blank, uh, you may have no idea. If I say the blank chases the blank in the savanna, you probably know that, you probably can guess it's neither a mouse nor a cat, okay? It's probably, you know, a lion and a zebra or something, or a wildebeest or whatever it is that we lions uh, eat uh, in the savanna. So because, because you know how the world works and you have some background knowledge, you can fill in those blanks. So the idea is that by training a system to fill in those blanks, and this is the whole idea of self-supervised learning, you, the system will learn basically the role of words in the sentence, their grammatical role, as well as the, some semantics, right? So we will know that you know, a cat can chase a mouse, but a lion can chase, uh, you know, lion can chase an antelope, but probably will not chase a mouse. Um, things like that, right? So what the system produces is not a single word, but it's gonna produce essentially an energy for every word in your, in your lexicon, in your vocabulary. Or if you run this to a softmax, the probability for each word in the dictionary, which you can train using cross entropy as a classifier, essentially, okay? So here is the correct word that appeared here. Here is the, you know, logits coming out of my, the weighted sums of the last layer of my network. And I compute the negative log likelihood uh, cost between them, which is of course entropy between the, you know, zero, zero, one, zero, 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 and whatever comes out of my softmax and me, my sat, just like a regular classifier. And I do this independently for all the words that I'm missing, which is by the way, incorrect. Uh, because if you do this independently for all the words that are missing, you're basically assuming that the words that are missing are independent of each other, which they are not. Um, but anyway, regardless, this works amazingly well. You can pre-train the system to represent, uh, learn representations of text by training it to fill in the blanks in the text. And if you take the representation of text somewhere inside of the network, it works really well, and it works particularly well if the architecture you train is a so-called transformer architecture. Okay, so this was the BERT uh, paper by Devlin in 2018. That really caused a revolution. The paper was put on archive uh, after it was uh, submitted to the ICLEAR uh, 2019 conference. Or maybe it was 2018, I can't remember. Uh, and within the six months between the time it was posted on archive and the time it was presented at iClear, it had uh, 680 citations or something like that, okay? So this really took the, the world by storm even before it was officially presented at the conference just because of the archive publication. Uh, there were really quick follow-ups uh, to this for Berta. It's kind of a, a version of Bert that was built at uh, Facebook, which is open source. Uh, and since then, there's been lots and lots of uh, uh, contribution. Uh, I kind of screwed up the reference here. This is Devlin. This was one in Devlin, and I kind of... Uh, one is the uh, attention is all you need. The other one is um, self-supervised running of, Bert, of transformers. Okay, so what is a transformer? There's a question first. Yes. Uh, so transformers are basically a differentiable hash table. Are there other data structures which can, which are differentiable and used in other type of architectures? Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, yes, in the sense that if you can come up with differentiable versions of a lot of uh, interesting functionalities that are normally used in either computers or algorithms, then it's great. There's not a huge amount of those. Um, there's only kind of a small, you know, there's like classes of uh, architectures that we talked about, right? There is uh, this associative memory, differential associative memory type architectures that we just talked about. There is recurrent nets, uh, of which LSTM and GRUs are kind of special cases that are particularly useful. And there is convolutional nets, of which ResNet are a particularly useful thing, which have the same idea as LSTM. You just have, you know, connections that skip so that the system doesn't get stuck if one of the layers behave badly. Uh, and uh, and then you have, you know, things like transformers, which basically combine some of those elementary objects for particular architectures. You have, you know, mixture of, mixture of, uh, of experts, which also use attention. So if you remember, I talked about mixture of experts, right? So mixture of experts is a network where you have like multiple experts, and then you have a, a sort of gating network that 
computes weights, uh, coefficients with which to combine the outputs of the multiple experts. So it basically chooses which of the individual network is the current expert for the particular sample that we are seeing. It's a, it's a form of attention as well, okay? So anywhere where you have multiplicative interactions, where you have you know, basically the, the weight of a network, uh, of a piece of a network being the output of another network, then you have multiplicative interactions. If uh, those weights are between zero and one and sum to one, you can call this attention, all right? Uh, but you may you may you might imagine all kinds of uh, other uh, you know sort of forms of those things that are all uh, differentiable. Uh, anyway, I'm not sure I answered to your satisfaction, but that's as much as I can do. Okay, um, so here is what a transformer is. Um, you take a you take an input, typically it's text, but people are increasingly applying this to essentially what amounts to image patches. Okay, so so if you take is a if your if your input is text, you uh, you represent those 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 words as as one hot vectors. You run them through a matrix, let's say, or that turn them into embedding vectors. Right. So your input now is a sequence of embedding vectors. And you're going to learn that matrix, of course. So it's similar to what I talked about earlier. You can combine those vectors, those representation vectors, with other data, like for example, the position within the sentence. Okay, and you can encode the position in various ways. Uh, a common way of encoding position is through uh, basically values of, uh, of sinusoids, right? So, um, so, and and I'll tell you in a minute why you need to encode the position. Um, but you do need to encode the position, okay? So you have a word on the input and it's part of a sequence of words, okay? And those are obtained using uh, uh, embedding matrix from, um, from you know, one hot, one hot vectors. Okay, so same, same diagram as here. Um, what you do here is that, so you, you, you basically uh, number, the, the position of each of those vectors with a number between zero and one. So let's say here you have five, so this would be zero, this would be 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, maybe put another one, so we go to one, all right? This is one particular way of doing it, people are doing it in various ways, but, um, but we're gonna add here um, to this vector, we're gonna add another vector And that vector is going to encode that position number in the following way. So that position number, okay, let's call it P. Uh, we're gonna run it through a sinusoid. Okay, and that's gonna be the first component of that vector. So if the position is 0.2, we're here. That height is, is something, we're gonna put this in the first component. Then we're going to have a second uh, sinusoid, and that second number is going to go into the the second component, and then a third one, and that goes into the third one, etc. And we, we we put as many of those as as is required to get the uh, to get the required precision. Okay, um, so. Um, those sinusoid are of frequency uh, one, two, three, four, etc., all the way up to whatever is required to kind of encode accurately all of those things. Okay, uh, and so that gives a vector that basically encodes the position in so continuous way, continuous differentiable way, if you want. So that's this positional encoding thing, and this is why there is a real sinusoid in it. Uh, then you go through a module called multi-head attention, which I'll describe in a second. Uh, you add this to the input, normalize, go through a couple layers of feedforward net with also skipping connection like ResNet, 
add and normalize. And you keep doing this. You, you, you take the output, feed it back to the input, and keep doing it. You know, stack multiple layers of this. Um, a typical transformer will have something like 40 layers, something like that. OK, and that's just the first part. Then there is the decoder that, that kind of produces the output. So let's say you want to produce, to produce a text one word at a time. Uh, you take the output of those first 20 layers, or whatever it is, uh, plug it to, again, uh, one of those multi-head attention uh, module, add a normalize, feed forward, add a normalize, uh, run through a linear classifier and softmax, and you add two probabilities for each word. Okay, so that is going to produce the first word. You sample from that softmax, that's the first word that comes out. You can take the word that has the highest probability, or you can sample from the distribution produced by the softmax. <clears throat> now, you take that word and you feed it back to the input, okay, to produce the next word. So that word now goes to the embedding, also it has positional encoding, so you tell it this is the first word that you're generating. Go through a few layers of, uh, of, your, uh, of your network, uh, run through those. This also has multiple layers. This is multiplied n times, 20 times or something. At the output, run through the linear uh, module, softmax, produce a second word, feed that back to the input, and do it again. And you do this sequentially to produce all the words in your output. The, the text generation is quite expensive because of this kind of so-called autoregressive uh, way of generating words. OK, now, so this is a sort of general architecture of a, of a transformer that transforms text into text. Um, and I don't like the name very much, because transformer is a little too generic. Uh, and there's also something called graph transformer network, which you will, you will learn about next week. Is that right? Uh, through a guest lecture, which has nothing to do with this. Next week, there is Ishan. OK, so it's the week after next, then. Then it's Ani. Yeah. Ani Hanun, uh, who's yeah. going to talk about graph transformer networks. Do not confuse transformers and graph transformer networks. Um, OK, so what is this multi-head attention thing that we just talked about? Um, so you take uh, multiple embeddings, which are vectors that represent your input, all right? And then you run through one of those modules. And what one of those modules does is uh, so-called self-attention. OK, so what does that mean? It means that one input is used as a query, but all the other inputs are used as keys. OK, so instead of having a associative memory where the keys are stored in the memory, the keys are actually inputs, right? So this is basically a, an attention mechanism, right? So we uh, so we have an input. Um, we have an input, all right? But we have other inputs as well. Uh, we're just going to consider this this particular guy. So this guy will view this view it as a query, okay? And we're going to call it QI. And all of these guys, whatever comes out of these guys, we call them keys. OK. And we're going to compute in a module here we're going to compute the dot product of that query which, with all of the keys. OK. So here, and we're going to softmax them. So here we're going to get a bunch of coefficients. And uh, sorry, I should call them CJ, OK, CJI, or CIJ, rather. So this is CIJ. And CIJ is equal to uh, the dot product between QI transpose and KJ, all right? And then we're going to plug them into a softmax. Um, so this is really a softmax of those guys. Softmax over, over J, right? 
But here's the thing, we're gonna do this for every, uh, every input. So this guy here has a module on itself that is going to produce you know, ci minus one j. And same for this guy. And same for this guy, et cetera. So what we get in the end is a matrix cij. And this matrix is the result of computing all the dot products of all the qi with all the kj. And the qi and the kj can be the same or can be different. Um, it can be two vectors attached to every location, a Q and a K, or it could be that the K of one location is the Q, uh, actually. Okay, and that matrix is called a self-attention matrix, right? So it's a big matrix uh, where you normalize the rows so that for a particular I, the, the numbers on that row are normalized through a softmax, okay? So you apply a softmax to the rows, and so you get a bunch of coefficients between zero and one that sum to one and you get one for e every location. Now, here is a inter very interesting characteristic of this. So, okay, so this is one head of a multi-head attention. And uh, what's called the, 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 the multi-head is that you do this multiple times with multiple vectors k, essentially. Um, and then in the end, you, you also have, you know, a process by which you compute a, a weighted sum of a bunch of values. And you can have multiple of those values. So that's the, the multi-head. Okay, so each of those guys has vectors V, uh, which I should represent as bubbles. You, you multiply uh, the coefficients coming out of this uh, attention, which each of the V vectors. Symbols here are difficult to read. You sum them up. And you do this multiple times with multiple V, that's a multi-head. So at the, at the output, you get multiple vectors here that are you know, basically combinations of all the Vs. Uh, um, with, with coefficients that are those self-attention uh, coefficients. This is all differentiable. It's like an associative memory, okay? You can learn the Vs, you can learn the, the Qs, the Ks, et cetera. Now, here is a very interesting property of this, uh, of this system. Um, okay, so I should say, you don't get a single output, you get one output per input, right? Because every one of, of those guys produces, uh, you know, CIs by which you can compute a linear combination of the Vs. And so you get one for each of the outputs, you're going to get an output vector, right? Um, so now here is an interesting property of this. So you, you'll, you'll get as many output vectors as you have input vectors. They may be different size. Uh, generally, they're the same size. The interesting property is that it's equivalent to permutation. So if you change the order of the inputs, the outputs also change their order, but are otherwise unchanged, okay? And it's a crucial property because now what you have is a neural net module because of the self-attention, is a neural net module that basically gives you a, a that computes an operation on the set. It doesn't care about the order in which the element come in. It doesn't even care about the numbers of the number of them because you can run this self-attention with sort of as many inputs as you want. So it's variable variable size input uh, if you if you wish. Um, assuming you have the v's that correspond to that, uh, but it's equivalent to permutation. Okay, it only cares about the elements that are on the input. If you change the order, it changes the order of the output, but doesn't change the result otherwise. This is a very interesting property because it means that if you need to process something, uh, you know, independently of order, that's really great. Uh, independently of relative positions, that's really great. Now, if you want to put some information about the, the position, you use this positional encoding that I was telling you about. 
Okay, so the position of the word in a sentence in English actually matters. Okay, there are some languages in which the position of a word within a sentence doesn't matter that much. In English, it does, because the grammar in English is pretty weak. Um, but there are languages like uh, like German or French where the grammar is a bit stronger, and so the order of words doesn't matter as much, nearly as much. Um, and you know, you may need to encode the the position. You may need to break this equivalence to position of that uh, uh, transformer because you know it really matters where a word appears. But the point is, the overall function is independent of, uh, with respect to permutations. Uh, so this works just ridiculously well. I mean, particularly in the context of the, the BERT uh, model. Okay, so now I, I have the, the correct references here. So multi-head attention, which is the, the transformer architecture, is was when he, uh, 2017. And then the BERT model is uh, Devlin et al. Uh, 2018, Th these are two groups from Google. Uh, and this used like unsupervised uh, you know, filling in the blank, you know, using autoencoder or mass autoencoder. So, uh, so this really kind of revolutionized natural language processing completely. And now people are trying to apply this to images and it's, it's kind of working pretty well, at least in certain situations. Um, to the extent that a lot of people are saying, we're not gonna use conventional nets in the future, may or may not be true. Um, okay, so, Standard applications of this include things like translation, uh, like uh, uh, text generation in various forms, although it doesn't work that well, uh, uh, at least when they're trained this way, this particular way. Um, and you know, representing text in general so that you can train on a supervised downstream task, like say, uh, classifying the topic of, uh, of, of a text, uh, Determining the tone of a text, is it positive or negative? Is it judgmental? Um, is it bullying? Is it hate speech? Uh, is it a call to violence? You know, things like this. So those things are used a lot, both by Google and Facebook for uh, uh, content moderation, essentially. And it's only in the last year or two because those models have only appeared in the last year or two. Uh, some of those models are multilingual. So they, you train them with input sentences from multiple languages and they automatically kind of learn um, like to detect the language and sort of do the appropriate representation. So what you get in the end is a representation of text that is independent of language. And that's very useful because what that means is now you can train a hit speech detector for whatever language your, your, your birth system or your, your uh, transformer was, uh, was trained to represent. And so it's very important when you want to be able to do uh, you know, content moderation in a lot of different languages for which you may not have a lot of uh, training data. Uh, and this is, again, very widely used by uh, both, both Google and Facebook and various other companies. So here's a inter interesting example. This was uh, a system that was initially proposed by Guillaume Lamp and Alexis Conneau, who were at, at Facebook in Paris. Uh, they were both PhD students, actually. It was working in Paris, and they, they proposed to train in this self-supervised, semi-self-supervised manner, to train a system to, uh, to translate, like a transformer system to translate. And the way they, they did it was, you take a, a sequence in English, and the same sequence in French, okay? Uh, the, the same sentence, meaning the same thing, more or less. Uh, and you remove some of the, some of the words, um, so here, you remove uh, the word curtain, you remove the word where, right? So the sentence in English is, uh, the curtain were blue. Uh, here, les rideaux étaient bleus, okay, which is the translation. So here you move curtain and where, and here you remove le, which is the article, and bleu, which is blue, the color. Okay, and, and you train the system to predict those, those missing words. And as a, as a consequence of this training, the system learns to basically when it wants to produce the word bleu in, in French, which corresponds to the, the blue, uh, the word blue in the English uh, version, it doesn't have that word in French, but it has it in English. So it learns the translation, okay, automatically. It learns to pay attention to the corresponding word in the English translation. 
so you you train the system that way to fill in the blanks basically in uh, in sentences, and what you get at the end is uh, a system that can translate. Uh, I mean, you have to do a few more things to to get it to work to any kind of uh, you know state of the art. Um, this requires also positional encoding in in, in the in the two sentences, but um, it's pretty amazing. Uh, you can, of course, you know, train each half separately to represent text uh, in a in any language, and uh, and you can do this for any number of languages. So there are systems now that can translate, you know, a couple hundred languages into into in, into them. Uh, Guillaume Lampe was the same same guy again with uh, François Charton, also at Facebook in Paris, a couple of years ago. Uh, in fact, last year they they just open sourced their code just last week. Uh, they trained a, a system, uh, a transformer system, supervised in this case, uh, but it's a transformer architecture to uh, solve differential equations and compute integrals symbolically, right? So you give an equation like this, uh, y prime equals blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's a differential equation. And it gives you the solution. Okay, symbolically. It represents it as some sort of tree, if you want. Um, which is encoded in the sequence, the output sequence of the transformer. And the way they do this is that they start from formulas and then they generate differential equations whose those, you know, for which those formulas are solutions. Uh, they do the same with integrals, they do the same. I mean, this, this is an integral really, right? This is just computing an integral. But if you have uh, if you have something like this where where this is differential equation, this is just computing an integral, this is differential equation. So for computing an integral, you can easily generate data. Just generate a random formula, then differentiate it symbolically, which you can do automatically fairly simply, simplify or not the, the resulting uh, formula, and then train the transformer to turn the, the, the derivative into the integral of it. Okay. You can generate as much data as you want. Uh, this is their old results. They actually have better results now, but you can basically have symbolic solutions to ordinary, ordinary differential equations of the first and second order, as well as integrals. And this works kind of really good, really well. Like uh, it, sol it, it solves the, the problem like better than like traditional approaches to this, like, you know, that are used in Mathematica, MATLAB and Maple. Uh, here's another example of a use of a transformer. This is for a dialogue system. So here, um, System is trained to, you know, basically respond dialogue with uh, with someone. But this particular one, uh, actually, uh, this is called uh, MM Blenderbot. So Blenderbot is kind of a dialogue system that was built at Facebook, and and the MM version is one that uh, is multimodal, so it can it can look at pictures. So here, uh, you look at this picture. There's a a human as well as the bot, and they talk to each other about the picture. So first thing, I would love to take this teddy bear for a spin on my motorcycle. Ha, ah, would the teddy bear ride in the basket in front of you or in the sidecar? In front of me, of course. I don't want to get hit by a car. Yeah, it's a good point. The sidecar would take up a lot of room. I think it would be fun to ride on the back of a motorbike with a stuffed animal in the basket. Do you ride your motorbike often? I used to ride a lot when I was younger, but I've been on one in, in a long time. So you have to figure out like, which of those is the human. Uh, and which is the machine. I think the machine is the gray one and the human is the blue, if I remember correctly. <laughs> um, so same here. So this is a system that has basically a commercial net that looks at the picture, extracts a representation of the picture, that's one input to the transformer, and the transformer has been trained on dialogues of, of people actually commenting on an image. So this was collected through Amazon Mechanical Turk, and, and the system basically learns to kind of emulate um, human dialogues. So this is an entertaining and fun uh, chatbot, making a chatbot that's actually useful is much more difficult. And people basically can do it other than by sort of building them by hand at the moment. So this is a, a big challenge for the next few years is to figure out how to kind of build or train chatbots that are useful. Uh, so you can, uh, using those transformers and memory networks and, and, and various tricks around those ideas, uh, you can basically Compile the entire knowledge of Wikipedia into a, into a, you know, collection of associated memories inside of a neural net. 
Uh, and so then you can ask a question to uh, one such neural net, um, which would have billion, or hundreds of billions of, uh, of, of, of connections, of weights, of parameters. You can ask any question, and if the answer is somewhere in Wikipedia, that system will probably be able to answer the question. Okay. Some of you may have seen uh, GPT-3. So GPT-3 is a slightly different type of model, which is just trying to predict the next word in a, in a text using some sort of context. Um, and it stores so much, it has so many parameters, 175 billion or so. That's so many parameters that, uh, you know, whenever you give a text prompt, it's, it kind of has something that's similar in its associative memory. And essentially just by running through the network, through the network will generate text that sounds a plausible continuation of that initial prompt, um, including if the prompt is a specification of a problem, which is kind of uh, surprising. So it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, uh, it's not practical really for practical applications yet. Um, some studies that show that it's not particularly reliable. So, you know, building a chatbot that is impressive or entertaining is easy. Uh, building one that's useful is much, much tougher. So this, this sort of Wikipedia answering system that I was telling you about, um, if you ask a question like, what is the population of Germany? It will answer easily. If you ask a question like, uh, what is the country that has a common border with Germany with the largest uh, commercial exchanges with China? Then it can do it. Because what the system will have to do is go through a lot of different Wikipedia articles, read tables, uh, and then you know sort the numbers in the table, like you know cross correlate the values in the table to figure out, and then look at a map and then figure out like which countries uh, have a border with Germany. And, and so it requires a sequence of actions. It requires complex planning that none of the systems can do at the, uh, at the time. So this is a big challenge for the next few years. Uh, getting machines like this that can reason and basically plan the sequence of actions to answer a question, for example, or solve a problem for people. And that's what we'll have. If we have this one day, we'll have virtual assistants that can you know, do a lot for us. Um, here's another example of a, um, uh, of a transformer system uh, called DETER. So this was uh, proposed by uh, Nicolas Carion and a large casting character also at Facebook Air Research in Paris. Nicolas Carion is actually a, a postdoc uh, at NYU right now. Um, and it's open source. Uh, you can play with it if you want. And it's basically a vision system that combines a convolutional net with a transformer. This is where the world is going, okay? The, the latest vision systems basically do that now. They combine calm nets and transformers. Some of them actually don't have any calm nets anymore. They just use a transformer all the way down to, so they basically break up the image into patches, overlapping or non-overlapping, and then run those patches through an, an embedding matrix or or through a couple layers of a convnet to produce a representation. Uh, and then everything is done through a transformer. Okay, and those seem to work pretty well. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the prevailing uh, approach at the research level at the moment is, is kind of to, to use a combination of the two. So, conventional net for the low layer and uh, transformer for the high layer. So, here's how it works you take an image, run it through a conventional neural net that produces basically uh, feature maps that are dense image features, okay? Uh, you can pre-train this or, or not, uh, and supervised. Then you take that and feed it to a transformer, uh, which you can think of as kind of an encoder decoder. That transformer uh, has a bunch of slots that correspond to uh, objects in the image. Typically it has 100 slots. Okay, which are 100 different inputs, if you want. Uh, and, and those are basically feature vectors that, you know, the feature vector that come out of the conventional nets are inputs to that transformer. So that transformer kind of uh, produces a, a list. And, and remember, a transformer is equivalent to the permutation. So it doesn't matter which order you, you show this to the transformer. It's, you know, I mean, you do positional encoding, of course. So uh, you indicate at wh which location each of those feature vectors are. You run through the transformer, the transformer produces, the output of the transformer is uh, a bunch of, of vectors with a softmax vector that is probability over categories together with uh, 
a, a, a position of a bounding box for that object. Okay. And, it, and again, because the transformer is equivalent to, to uh, the permutation, it's going to produce this in whatever order is natural for it to produce. Okay. So it has 100 empty slots and it fills them with a different object. Okay. And you train that system supervised. So you train it. So the thing is, you don't know when the system produces those boxes, you don't know which object here that it produces corresponds to what actual object in the image for supervision. So you do something called bipartite matching loss. So you say, okay, I know there is a, there's a, a seagull in this image. Uh, let me look in all the slots that the system produces for something that's close to seagull. Oh, here is a, a box that I puts a score, a high score for seagull. So I'm gonna decide that that is the seagull category. Uh, the bounding box seems similar. The score is high for seagull. So I'm gonna match this slot with that uh, label, right? Uh, same for this guy, it's gonna be easy because the bounding boxes are slightly different. So that's also a seagull at a different location. Um, but then the system produces another uh, box here with some score, which doesn't have an equivalent. So, you know, the bipartite matching has to kind of take that into account that some object may appear here that don't appear in the input and some objects that, you know, may be filled up in one of the slots here may have no corresponding uh, thing. So this graph matching, this sort of bipartite graph matching kind of figures out the best uh, matching. And you can think of this as finding the minimum of some energy over a latent variable, okay? The latent variable being the, the pairing. Uh, so here's the overall architecture. Uh, convolutional net produces dense uh, image features. Uh, you do positional encoding um, to indicate the location of each of the features. Feed this uh, through a transformer that has as many inputs as you have, uh, you know, locations in the feature maps, if you want. Okay, so each of those inputs is a, a vector of uh, values for all features at one location. And you have one of those for each location uh, in the feature maps. You run through that. Um, so you get a representation that's used as a contextual input for a, a transformer, okay? Which itself is a decoder. And this one has object slots. So it has typically 100 slots. Um, and you put object queries in it. So those are fixed vectors that are learned. You can think of them as weights, actually, that are learned by, by gradient descent. Uh, but from the point of view of the transformer, they actually are inputs. They are like input embeddings. But they are learned through gradient descent, right? So they are, they're, they are used as parameters. They're learned as parameters. But for a transformer architecture, they, they look like inputs. Um, you run through this uh, transformer. I don't know how many layers it has, maybe 40 or so, maybe 20, I can't remember. Uh, and, and then you, you do this matching with the, the categories. Uh, to, so you run through a feedforward net to compute a, a basically a, a score for each category as well as a bounding box, okay? And then to train the system, you do this uh, pairing of the, the targets to whatever comes out, uh, and you compute the, you backpropagate the gradient, you say, well, you know, the category here, you do compute the cross entropy with the desired category, which is seagull. Uh, you compute the error with the bounding box, that's a regression problem. You backpropagate to all the ones that have a pair, backpropagate all the way to the transformer, backpropagate all the way here, update those uh, uh, embedding vectors here, backpropagate through the encoders, and I think all the way all the way back to the to the comnet. I'm not sure actually the backpropagate all the way to the comnet or if the comnet is pre-trained. Um, I think the backpropagate all the way. So it's basically you know you need to sort of pre-train some of those things, but essentially you, you get a end-to-end uh, -end system. Now, what the transformers are doing is what is the equivalent of something that was done by hand before, called non-maximum suppression. And what's cool about the, the transformer is that it does essentially object-based reasoning, right? So it basically reasons about objects and says, 
So you can say things like, you know, here there are two elephants and there's one in front of the other because, and, and I know it's an elephant because uh, it has a trunk and four legs and a tail. And it's, a, you know, it's smaller than this guy. And, you know, this guy is behind it, obviously. Uh, I'm not seeing all of it, but, you know, I'm paying attention to the trunk here. So those highlighted areas uh, are basically uh, running through this encoder, looking at what the attention, the self-attention circuit pay attention to, which part of the input they pay attention to, okay? And you highlight that on the image, and that tells you what the system uses to really kind of arrive at the answer it arrives at, okay? Which is pretty cool. Um, same for zebra, zebras, so we can, you know, tear apart multiple zebras, and zebras have evolved to be in the business of kind of confusing, uh, you know, predators about their numbers, basically, or where they are. Uh, that's, that's the world of the stripes. Uh, so this works really amazingly well. Um, there are competing approaches that work, you know, similarly, but the, they, all, they also use transformers on top of functional nets that are trained slightly differently, use slightly different principles, but this is really kind of uh, revolutionary in my, in my opinion, really recent. Um, instead of training the system to just produce bounding boxes, you can train it to produce masks for every object. So the output here uh, of this feed forward net is not just a softmax vector, but it's actually an image, like a binary image of where the object is. And, and this works really well as well, um, where, um, you know, for panoptic segmentation. Um, so this uses the, you know, multi-head multi attention transformer uh, that produces attention maps, and then you run this through a commercial net that, and you train it to produce masks. And, and so it can basically, you know, outline, uh, not only sort of detect and, and, and recognize every object in the image, but also draw an outline of uh, every one of them. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of progress in, um, in computer vision due to, um, due to that. So in the five minutes that are left, uh, and I'm afraid we'll talk about this in the future. Um, I want to talk about this, this idea of planning uh, I was telling you about earlier. And here is the name of the algorithm that, you know, I, tell, I told you about the KD Bryson or I joint state method, uh, where you have an observation about the state of the world, which you uh, run through a perception module that it basically estimates the state of the world. And then you have a model of the world that tells you the state of the world at time t plus one as a function of the state of the world at time t, the action you're taking, and perhaps some latent variable that represents everything you don't know about the world that may, may occur. Okay, and you may need to sample multiple values of this to generate multiple features, uh, or go exhaustively maybe if it's a discrete variable. Okay, so model predictive control is this idea that by some minimization algorithm, could be gradient based or not, uh, could be based on dynamic programming, you find a sequence of actions over time that will minimize the overall cost uh, computed from, uh, from your state. Okay, so you might be wondering, okay, you're doing control. Uh, I heard that people use reinforcement learning for this. This is not reinforcement learning. This is optimal control, okay? The difference between optimal control and reinforcement learning is twofold. Uh, so first of all, if we were doing reinforcement learning, this would be called model-based reinforcement learning because inside of this, we have this model of the world that predicts the next state from the previous state. But in, re in reinforcement learning, you don't know what this cost function is. Okay, you're not told what this cost function is. The only way you know the value of this cost function is that you take an action and then you wait for the world to tell you whether, whether the outcome of this action was good or not. And you may not get an, uh, uh, a response for every action you take. You might only get it at the end. So you play a game of chess or go, you only get the answer at the end if you lose or if you, if you win. You're not being told in the meantime whether your action you took was good or bad, okay? So reinforcement learning, the difference between optimal control and reinforcement learning is that in optimal control, you know the cost function, you can backpropagate gradient to this, or at least you can compute it. And so you know in which way to change your action so that your uh, cost function goes down. Reinforcement learning, you don't know the cost function. You only know the value of the cost function by taking an actual action in the world and then waiting for the world to tell you uh, whether this action was good or bad. And it may only tell you this at the end of a sequence, a long sequence. And so you get very, very sparse uh, reward or punishment. Uh, which you can think of as a value of a cost. And so it's much more difficult to do reinforcement learning. 
uh, because you don't have what's called intrinsic motivations. So you don't have a cost that you know that you compute yourself, right? Uh, humans, in the base of our brain, we have something called the basal ganglia, and that's where our brain computes if we are comfortable, happy, hungry, uh, thirsty, if we hurt or not, okay? And the rest of our brain basically is there to satisfy that piece of the brain, and that's that piece of the brain is our cost function, okay? It's the thing that tells you you're in a good, you know, a good state or a bad state. Uh, all the actions we take is to basically minimize the expected value of that cost over time, including long term. Uh, and we have the better of a model of the world that we have to do this, uh, the better we can do it. Okay, so let's say we want to train a car to drive itself. We need to have a way of predicting what cars around us are going to do. Um, so we're going to observe, let's say this is a view, a top down view of a piece of a highway. Our car is the blue car, and we, we've we observed what happened around us for a while with some sensor, LiDAR, or camera, or whatever. What we need to do is being able to predict what's going to happen next in the world, okay? And one architecture we can use is one that we've already studied, um, which is a, a conditional variational autoencoder, okay? So a conditional variational autoencoder, what is it? Uh, you observe X, you run it through a predictor, you get a hidden representation of the past, uh, so called H. That H goes into a decoder, the decoder combines this H with uh, a latent variable, which represents what we don't know about what's going on in the world, and then run this with the decoder, and the decoder makes a prediction for what the next state of the world is going to be in the form of an image in this case. All right? We can train the system by minimizing the, the, the prediction error over recorded sequences of the camera looking down uh, you know, at, at cars in a, in a highway. Now, uh, because inference of this latent variable might be hard, uh, and we may need to marginalize over it. We're going to use a variational autoencoder. So we're going to use Y and H run into an, to an encoder to predict a guess as to what the best value of Z is. And then we're going to basically sample the Z value uh, around, you know, uh, with a Gaussian distribution where the mean is produced by the, by the encoder. And the standard deviation is maybe another output of the encoder or not. Uh, we're also going to have a prior here for the Z that, you know, it should be mostly zero or, uh, you know, close to zero, let's say. Um, and, and then run that to the encoder. So once the system is trained, uh, of course, when we want to do inference, predict what the Y is going to be for a given X, we don't have access to Y. And so we're going to have to sample that Z from uh, a Gaussian distribution or some distribution, according to this prior, perhaps, and, and run it through this. And that's going to be to allow our system to make multiple predict future predictions from a single observation of the past. And that's a demonstration uh, of that. So this is a project that Alfredo was involved in, as well as uh, Michael Enaf, who's a former student of mine. So this is the a recorded, on the left is a recorded uh, sequence from a camera uh, looking down a highway. And what you see here, uh, the, you know, immediately to the, to the right of the, the recorded, uh, uh, sequence is um, what happens when you don't have a latent variable. So when you don't have a latent variable, uh, you set it to zero all the time, you just run through the encoder decoder. What you get is increasingly blurry predictions because the system doesn't know really if other cars are going to accelerate or brake or whatever. And so it sort of predicts the average and that's kind of a blurry, a blurry prediction. Those four columns here on the right are different predictions made for different uh, drawings of the latent variable Z. So the latent variable Z is a sequence. You, you draw the, the Zs over a sequence. And for different drawings of that sequence, you get different future predictions. And those are the different future predictions. And the square and the circles indicate the same car being tracked in different ways, like behaving differently for the different values of the latent variable. So that's a good example uh, of showing how, you know, one of those latent variable models can actually make multimodal predictions, right? Um, and so you can use this to do model predictive control, uh, run this for a couple seconds. The, the prediction is every tenths of a second, every hundred millisecond. And so you can run this for, you know, 20 times or something. And uh, uh, what you get is, um, you know, a two second segment. You can plan over two seconds. We can run it for longer and plan over longer. Uh, 
uh, and that, that would be model, model PDT control. It's kind of expensive. So another thing you can do, and the cost function, by the way, is something that measures the distance of your car to the other cars and whether your car is in, in lane or something like this. Uh, what you can do is, instead of having to reason and infer the sequence of actions at every time step, you can train a neural net called a policy network to predict that action. And it's basically just backprop, right? So unwell your model of the world, your cost function, uh, initialize it with an initial observation, um, run through this, and then through backpropagation, backpropagate through the entire thing so that you adjust the weights of this policy network in such a way that it takes an action that over time will minimize the uh, objective, okay? So this is sort of gradient-based policy learning, okay? Or again, it's not reinforcement learning because you know the cost function and you can differentiate it. Uh, but it's kind of learning a direct controller by backpropagation through time, assuming you have a good model of the world. Uh, and this actually works. Okay, um, I will conclude because I'm out of time anyway. Uh, so we talked about self-supervised learning. We talked about the fact that we can train very large networks with self-supervised learning. This is clearly the future of AI, there's no question. Um, and one of the challenges is handling uncertainty in the prediction. And we can use energy-based models for this. We can use latent variable models if we really want to do prediction, or we can use joint embedding methods uh, if we only want to run representations. Um, we can do reasoning and planning through energy minimization. Energy-based models, basically, with latent variables or not, can allow us to do this. They give us a framework for how to do this properly. Uh, we don't, you know, we don't do logic and symbols. We basically replace symbols by vectors, and we replace logic by continuous energy functions that we can compute gradients of, essentially. But that's how we do reasoning. Um, we don't know how to learn hierarchical representations of action plans yet. Um, like we, I have no idea. Um, now. Perhaps this is sort of a blueprint for a kind of future autonomous intelligent system uh, through, through AI, if you want, or what some people call AGI, artificial general intelligence. I do not believe in the concept of artificial general intelligence because I don't think even human intelligence is particularly general. Um, I, I think it makes sense to talk about human level AI, but not about general intelligence. Human intelligence is very, very specialized. Less specialized than cats or rats, but or dogs, but still very specialized. Um, so perhaps one day we'll be able to put this whole thing together, where we have a system that has perception, which in our brain happens in the back of the brain. We have a cost function, which is in the basal ganglia, the base of the brain. Uh, we have a model of the world that allows us to predict what's going to happen in the world as a consequence of our actions, or or just because the world is being the world, and predict multiple outcomes. Uh, we may have a critic, and a critic is basically a neural net, another neural net, a module that predicts what the future value of the cost is going to be, right? So if I, if I come to you, you know, uh, and unexpectedly I pinch, your, I, I pinch your arm, right? Uh, you're going to be surprised. You're probably, you're probably going to step back and kind of wonder what's, you know, what came over me, right? The next time I come to see you, you may be a little careful, right? Because you're going to wonder if I'm going to pitch your arm. And that's basically your critic predicting what your ultimate level of pain is going to be. You felt pain. That was an immediate cost. Uh, but you have this neural net that predicts for a given situation what is going to be the expected value of that cost in the future, OK? Uh, now that you know that I'm a pitching guy, you, you're going to you know, step back. Um, because of this. This is perhaps the source of a lot of emotions. So emotions basically are anticipation of good or bad outcomes. And, and the fact that we can predict in advance whether an outcome is going to be good or bad, that creates things like fear, elation, uh, and things like that. Right? There are more immediate emotions like, like, like hunger and thirst, and those are directly in the cost. But, but you know, Packing your lunch for the day because you know you're not going to be able because you're going on a hike, you know that's basically your critic telling you, okay, I know I'm going to be out of any food source for a long time, so I need to pack my lunch beforehand. Um, now, what we have here also is that in our brain, you know, humans essentially can do only one thing at a time. We can pay attention to only one thing at a time, and we can think about essentially only one thing at a time uh, deliberately. And so perhaps what the reason for this is that we only have one engine to be the model of the world. And that engine is configurable to the situation at hand. 
Uh, but we, are, we have only one. So we need a way to configure that engine to handle the situation at hand, whether we are sending, whether we are building something, whether we are talking to someone. Uh, we need to configure our attentive uh, model of the world to the situation at hand. And that's probably done by this kind of configuration engine. And maybe that's the source of consciousness, what we call consciousness. It's a consequence of a limitation of our brain that we only have one world model, essentially. Well, one engine as world model. And the actor is the module that figures out what sequence of action should I take so that given the, world, the, the model of the world that I have, how do I minimize the cost predicted by my critic or computed by my cost, given my current perception? Okay, so that may be the architecture of future autonomous AI systems. Um, nobody has really kind of built anything close to this. I mean, some reinforcement learning systems have some of the components, but not all of them. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for going over time. <laughs>